So microservices, everybody's talking about microservices in their environment. What are they? You, to us, about a year ago, we were taking a look at our cloud and how people were actually consuming the cloud. And we had this, this great idea that we could actually make it a lot more consumable. So where we traditionally been deploying apps with some monolithic service styles and some older legacy tools, we, we saw an opportunity to actually completely rewrite our tool chain. And with microservices, people could start writing small, discrete pieces of code and we could roll them out off source control, commit, roll them out. Have you seen this? Yeah. I remember that when microservices start, I successfully ignored them for, <laughs> for more than two years because it was like developers playing ground and like fiction that you can take the container and bring it into production. And I remember that when, when we test it and try it and get the real workload inside, the networking was very poor and inside of the Docker itself, it's poor. Yeah. It's just for the developer's laptop. But when the open contrail uh, came in the game, we saw that it's starting to be usable. And together with orchestration tools like Kubernetes, it's starting to be make more sense for us. And we look at it and realize that we really can use it. And together with connection with multi-cloud, we can actually scale our web application front ends into containers and store the data in the databases in virtual machine on our open state and federate them with the open content solutions together, which is, which is amazing. Yeah? It's like a dream for, uh, for, for someone who can build this infrastructure. So if you dig into microservices, what do you think one of the key values of actually changing your architecture to a microservice architecture is? I think that it's quick. It's very quick. You can rolling update in seconds, not in minutes. And I remember when I presented at Vancouver, the booting, we decreased time to market for, for the customer from 10 days to 45 minutes. And you said to me, oh, it's, it's not possible in our way. It's, it's acceptable. I was, I, I was kind of laughing. 45 minutes is an eternity in the crowd. And we were like heroes in, in the enterprise. <laughs> but the, yeah, so microservices, quick, real segmentation, and you don't care so much about IP addresses, but about service endpoints and services inside. You make your application developers happy and your operational people is actually a real DevOps with microservices. I think microservices is just a natural evolution of the application, right? In the past, we had these huge bare metal servers and you need to put as much as possible because you actually wanted to use as much as possible of the resources given by that box, right? We start virtualizing things to go to workloads. Okay, now I don't need to run everything in the same box and partitioning that now you have like containers and other technologies. So your application becomes a little bit more granular and that makes the application developer happy because they commit something, they patch something and the continuous integration system that they need to approve that commit goes back in minutes, right? Because you need it needs to test exactly that part of the integration. It doesn't need to test everything, right? And now when you move it to production and you have a very dynamic technology to actually connect it with the rest of the services seamlessly, you don't need to actually bother operations teams with multiple number of tickets that actually know what happened. Sometimes actually you create a very good middleware between what the application framework is and the operation system could be like a simple push red button and that's it. Right, absolutely. I think we were going after the, the time to market use case and the developer experience. It's the app dev, right? So when you actually break down how you would write an app on VMs, it's, you need to know a lot about operational things, right? How I tie a load balancer, some networking, some storage. But these container orchestration systems really just give you a pane of glass and you don't actually know what's happening so much behind the scenes. They give you the application. So all you're worried about is writing the code, right? So this is what we wanted to when we actually went and took pulse of how the developers were feeling. They were like, we don't deploy because we don't know how to rebuild. We built it once, but if you ask me to change all this, that's another problem. So when we actually started rolling out these discrete, very lightweight pipelines, which you can achieve with microservices, I saw one app that was deployed a hundred times in a week, just off commits. So what that actually meant in the background, which was a side effect, we weren't actually expecting it, code was becoming better because commits were becoming smaller and people were looking and testing 
faster rather than actually holding their PRs to these massive things because they don't necessarily know how to get them out in the environment. So when we went down the microservices journey, it was important for us, the whole Docker experience, you start on your laptop on a Sunday night and it's great. You spin up an app and you come into work on Monday and you go, can you put this in production? And obviously the answer is no. So we, we knew that we needed to get in front of this revolution, uh, that people were going to come to this naturally. So we'd already had the conversations with the open contrail community and we'd kicked off getting Kubernetes plugin ready in open contrail. So we knew that when we were going to production, we had the same security multi-tenancy brought to containers because that's something that actually hasn't come to pass in the container story yet. The networking is still largely ignored, but open contrail actually has a, a quite a solid story under Kubernetes to actually provide secure multi-tenant networks the same way they do it to VMs. So for the guys that are running the SDN, it's not difficult for them to get in this headspace. Correct. And you need, you need to think about the other side of the coin, your final users, right? They want more features, they want enhancement, they want patches to go to production right away. They don't want to wait a month. They don't want to wait for the next release. One of the things that we're very proud at Worthy is actually we release patches every week. Every week the applications are a little bit different. And that's because we have a very good integration with our overlay and our underlay to actually go to production in less than a week. We actually patch the system, our development systems, every other day, which means by Friday we already roll out three different patches. The only way to do it is to have the right overlay connection to the underlay, and that's when Open Control fits in this equation. So customers are happy, developers are happy, operations people are happy, we can move forward. Everyone's happy. Now, is, is 45 minutes still the goal? I think it was funny when I did the keynote at OpenStack Tokyo, our goal was a minute to have something deployed out just off a commit. But I, I think really the proof is that we can actually do that now. We have a, a story to do that. It's not that our goal was really a minute. It was that we actually have a framework that if we needed to get it out in a minute, we could actually get it out there reliably. And that speaks testament to what we have in the infrastructure. We weren't thinking about this two years ago, but now we're using the same infrastructure to actually provide this, getting, getting it out in a minute. So. I think the story is yet to come with microservices. People are still onboarding. It's vastly some, some uptakes. The big guys are starting to work with it. But you actually can build that story. So as we lay down in the next few years, I'm very excited to see how these technologies come together to build a story.